Thank you, Naveen. Thanks, Naveen. It's great to see everyone here. Uh, I'm going to be talking about feature engineering, and I'm going to talk about feature engineering doing it two ways, doing it in BigQuery and doing it in TensorFlow 2.0 or Keras. And of course, 2.0 is not out yet, so many of the things that I'm going to be talking about you will be able to do if you want to try it out if you install the nightly build of TensorFlow. So I'll quickly talk about how you could do that. But uh, the other thing that I'm super excited about is to talk about how to do it in BigQuery, because I think this is also pointing the way towards what's happening with machine learning and how it's getting democratized and getting easier and easier to use. The, the third aspect of it is, of course, it's about feature engineering. And one of the controversies about in machine learning is whether you need feature engineering in the first place. Right? And some of the amazing things that have happened when you looked at the previous uh, presenter with Krishnan showing you videos and images, one of the really cool things is that these days you need very little feature engineering to get image models to work. Right? And that's because convolutional networks, in some sense, act as feature extractors. And they're able to uh, do pretty much all of the things that we used to handcraft in terms of image filtering. But that's not yet the case for structured data. So even if you're dealing with structured data, you still need feature engineering. So I'll talk about how you do feature engineering, and I'll talk about how to do that uh, in both TensorFlow and uh, in BigQuery. So again, this talk is going to be completely focused on structured data, which is in some ways the unglamorous part of machine learning. Right? <laughs> it's not the stuff that people put on stage and talk about. But if you actually look in businesses, this is the part, this is the type of machine learning model that you will build the most often. And as data scientists, this is the model that you will tend to build the most often as well, simply because if it's an image model, you're going to use FaceNet or you're going to use ResNet and it's done, right? So in, in that sense, if you're saying, I'm going to learn how to do machine learning, it's going to be around unstructured data. I'm sorry, it's going to be around structured data, around tabular data. And so that's basically what we're going to be talking about. And again, like we did a like count a few years ago within Google, right? all of the machine learning models used at Google, and about 70% of our models were on structured data. So in spite of all the glamorous things about uh, smart reply and Google Photos and all that, 70% of all the machine learning models that are built at Google remain machine learning on a structured data, which is just my way of saying, like, hang with me here, right? Because this is actually an important problem when it, when it comes to enterprise. So where does the data come from if you're going to be doing uh, machine learning on structured data? Well, it goes, it's going to come from a data warehouse. And what I mean by a data warehouse is a centralized repository where you bring in data from all different parts of your organization. So you can join it, flatten it, and it's there. And because now you have all of the data, you can train your model on it. So for example, maybe we, we are a, you know, a firm that auctions vehicles, or we are a firm that uh, does repairs on vehicles. And we want to basically say, OK, these are all the uh, cars that we bought at auction. And this is how much we had to spend to repair those cars. And we have that historical data. And the idea is then, based on all the other columns in the data, we can create a model to predict what the cost of the repair is going to be. So the idea is that the next time we go to auction, we have all of that information. We can use it to kind of predict how much we will spend to repair that car. Right? So the idea is to train a model based on historical data and use it to go ahead and do your predictions. So once you've trained your model, then the idea is that you're basically going to use all these other features to go ahead and predict uh, to learn how to predict what the repair cost is going to be. And because the repair cost is a floating point number, what kind of a model is this? It's a regression model, right? If it were, if it were a, a categorical variable, then you would be basically training either a binary classification model or a multi-class classification model. But here, we're basically training it to predict a number. So once we have that, then, in real time, somebody from our firm is sitting at an auction site, and they basically say, if I were to purchase this car for this amount, and it has, had an, it has never had an accident, it was made in 2014, and it has 35,000 miles, 
what is the cost of repairs predicted to be, and you can basically get that prediction, and you can use that to inform how much you're going to basically bid on that car at auction. Right? So that's the basic formulation of your ML problem. You collect all your historical data, throw it in your data warehouse, you basically learn to predict one of the columns in that warehouse based on all the, all the other columns, and the idea being that you can then use it to make decisions in the future where you don't know what that cost is going to be. So that's great. So the, I, the example that I'm going to use in my demo is to estimate the cost of a ride, right? So the idea is that I'm going to basically have, a, a, have an app. I'm going to basically say, I'm at this location. I want to go to that other location. So I know what the pickup point is. I know what the drop-off point is. And I want to say, how much is it going to go from JFK to Wall Street Plaza? And I want to basically uh, create a machine learning model that predicts what the taxi fare is. The thing is that the way you compute the taxi fare in New York City is actually a deterministic rule-based algorithm. But the point being that there are multiple routes through the city, and depending on traffic, the taxi is going to take different routes. And so in essence, what we want to do is that we want to basically take the New York City taxi data and learn the map of New York. We want to learn the traffic patterns in New York. So we know that if you pick the car at 3 PM, this is the route that we are likely to take. We're going to basically pay a toll. And therefore, this is what the cost is going to be. Right? So that's the basic model. So even though it looks like a very simple problem where we're just taking the pickup latitude and drop off latitudes, we, in essence, want our machine learning model to learn traffic patterns. Okay? Uh, and essentially learn the map of New York. And we can do that because we have like a billion rides. The larger the data set you have, the better your ML model is going to be. And that's going to be true here, too. We have enough data that we can build relatively sophisticated models with just like three inputs. So the first way that I'm going to do it is that I'm going to use BigQuery ML. BigQuery is the data warehouse in Google Cloud. And the idea is that you can build a machine learning model directly in BigQuery using SQL. And the, and the idea is like you basically have many ways to do machine learning models at Google. Right? You can use AutoML. You can use BigQuery ML. You can write your own code with TensorFlow. And I'll show you both BigQuery ML and TensorFlow. And how do you choose between them? Well, the way you choose between them is based on how much control you want right? and how much time you're about to spend. And the more control you want, then you can basically go to a custom model. But for quick, fast development, there's nothing that beats something that is much easier to use, which is BigQuery ML. So the way it works is that we're going to go to our data warehouse. We're going to write a SQL query that pulls in the training data. And we're going to say, I'm going to create a model. And in this case, we want to predict the taxi fare. And that's a number. And so again, it's going to be a regression model. And then we'll evaluate the model, make sure it works well. And then whenever we need to go ahead and do a prediction, we can basically call the prediction on that model to, to essentially predict it. So how does this work? So let's say, right, right, this is a slightly different problem. But let's say that we have London bicycles. And we want to basically say, given uh, that somebody's renting a bicycle at a particular station at a particular time, how long are they going to keep it out? So we want to learn how to predict the duration. We want to learn how long they're going to keep the bicycle when they rent it out. So now this is just a select query where I'm pulling in the duration. I'm pulling in the start date, the time at which they rent the bike. And from that, I'm pulling out the day of the week. So this is my feature engineering. I'm not using the start date as is. Why don't I use the start date as is? Remember, the idea behind training a model is that you want to use it at prediction time. So if my start date is in historical time. I'm not, I do not want to learn to predict something that I already know. right? So I have to basically pull information out that I can use at prediction time later. So the, uh, even though I train on data from before, Later on, I'm going to basically use it for prediction. And so I can use things like Thursday. I can use things like 3 PM. I cannot use September 13 at 3 PM, because September 13 is gone. right? And it's never going to basically occur at prediction time. right? So we want to make sure that the values that we use in our model are things that we actually will see. So I'm pulling out the day of the week. I'm pulling out the hour of the day. 
these are the values that I get, I pull out the training data, and then I create the model. So that's basically it. I'm basically saying I want to create a model. It's like creating a table. It's called bicycle model, and it's a linear regression model, and it's learning how to predict the duration. Okay. A few minutes later, right, it basically gets created. So this is great, but this is just linear regression. Can we do something better? So more sophisticated. I don't know about better, but definitely more sophisticated. And the answer is yes. If you want to do deep neural net regression, just take the model type to be a DNN regressor. Say that you want 32 nodes in the first layer and four nodes in the second layer. And you're off to the races. And that's pretty much it. So let's, once you've trained the model, what can you do with it? Well, another SQL query. Please evaluate this model for me. And in this case, this is a text classification model. right? The regression model is just going to give you a mean square error. It's not that interesting. So I picked a different model to show you. So here is a text classification model. I'm saying go ahead and evaluate it for me. And it basically gives us the precision, the recall, the accuracy, F1 score, et cetera. In this case, the text classification model has three possible classes. So it basically shows us the three by three confusion matrix. Once you have a model, it's good enough. Then you can basically use it to predict. So in this case, right, these are the inputs into the model, government shutdown, et cetera. And I'm basically passing in one row in SQL. I'm saying, go ahead and predict for me. And it predicts that this particular article came from the New York Times. And this particular article, fitness, fitness tracker, came from TechCrunch. And again, you train this model if you basically have a bunch of titles of articles in your data warehouse. All in SQL, right? So that's kind of what I was saying by machine learning is getting a lot easier, much more democratized. And what we mean by that is more people can do it. So let's go ahead and take a, let's demo how we would do this in uh, SQL, okay? So out here, I have a Jupyter notebook. And again, I want to basically learn how to predict the fair amount. So this is the thing that I want to learn how to predict. I have a column that has the tolls that the person paid when they rode the uh, taxi, and the fare that they paid. The total is what I want to learn how to predict. And again, the inputs that I'll have into my model are the pickup longitude, the pickup latitude, drop off latitude, drop off longitude, and the number of passengers. So these are my inputs into the model. This is what I want to learn how to predict. So this is just a select statement. And then I say that I want to learn how to predict the fair amount. The rest of these are inputs. And the model type is linear regression. So we can go ahead and run this. Okay? And it takes like about a minute. So let me go ahead and do this. I can do it in the BigQuery console as well. So let me go ahead and do that. Uh, and I will basically, I will change the name of the model uh, so that I can continue showing you what that uh, looks like. So this is now running. And meanwhile, we can come back and we can look at the rest of the notebook. Okay. So we're here. We've trained the model. And again, I've already trained the model. It's already baked. So now I can go ahead and say, let's go ahead and clear all the outputs. Uh, clear all outputs. Let's go ahead and now evaluate the model. So what this is going to do is that by default, what BigQuery is going to do is that when I passed in that data, it split the data into training and evaluation pieces, trained on the training set, and it's showing me the statistics on the evaluation set. And in this case, because it's a regression model, it's basically telling me that the mean absolute error is $6. So it's predicting, the, it's learning how to predict the fare with a mean absolute error of about $6. Okay. But we, and it also shows us a mean squared error. I don't want mean squared error. I want root mean squared error. Well, go ahead and do it in SQL. Take the mean squared error, select square root of mean squared error. There we go, right? And we basically get our RMSE. And we can come back here. And you notice that this training is already done in 51 seconds, right? That's, again, 
the massive distributed scale of BigQuery, right? Just went off, did it on that, all of those machines, and we've trained our model. When was the last time you trained a production model in 51 seconds? <laughs> yes. So this looks, uh, you know, uh, it does a lot in a few, few lines of code. Right. You, you're hiding all the, you know, like the, the training test split, the learning rate, the hyperparameters. Right. Uh, but if, if you want to change something like that. Ah, I mean, okay, so this one, I've basically, okay, the question was, okay, the training test bit, hyperparameters, et cetera, you're just kind of uh, hiding all of this. What if, I, what if I want to change it? Here's, you see this option string? We can go there and you can change a bunch of stuff. Okay, so we can say, for example, okay, I want to also add L2 regularization, right? If you know what that is, no problem, right? BigQuery will let you do it. So you want to basically, you know, so you can change a variety of things. You can say, I want to change, I want to specify a split column I want to basically split it based on date. I want to take the first 80% of the data. You can do a variety of different things. It's all in that options thing. And is it automatically normalizing the input? It's, it's automatically scaling the input fields, absolutely. Right? It's doing many of the things that are like, considered best practice for a, for a type of problem. Okay. So we have the like, evaluation done. Okay. But the, but the training uh, error is like $9 RMSE. On this particular problem, I know that we can get to about $4.5. Okay? So I know that this is not a great model. But at least now we know how to do it, and that's what the rest of my talk is going to be about, is to how to improve it through feature engineering. Okay? But okay. The, the, of course, the first thing that you always want to do is whenever you do any kind of structured data is that you have to clean it up. And it turns out that when you go look at the New York City data and you explore it and you look at what kinds of trips are there, there are trips from New York to Philadelphia. There are trips from New York to Westchester County late at night. And there are those trips that cost $350, right? So you want to remove all of those things because it's not possible to really learn much from them. So that's basically what this one is doing. It's basically making sure that the fare meter was on, right? That was not just a cash ride. That, no, that basically the, uh, the boundaries were within the boroughs of New York and that, you know, that the, the, all of that, the fare meter was working in essence. So if you go ahead and we clean it up, then we can basically create a cleaned training data and we can train based on that. And at that point, then we basically get a slightly better error, right? So in this case, I'm evaluating on the cleaned data and we basically go from a $9 uh, model to an $8 model. Right? Again, the kind of thing that you would expect doing some amount of prep preparation work rather than just throwing the raw data into it. All that stuff doesn't change. What changes is that it's really easy to train a model. Okay. So, I showed you how to do that in BigQuery ML. Let's step back a bit and say, how would we do that in TensorFlow 2.0 and Keras? Right? So very similar things. Okay? So we're going to basically go ahead and read our data using TF data. Because again, the, I, the, cool, the reason that BigQuery could be that easy is because it was just SQL and it knew where the data was. It was already in BigQuery. You don't have to move it out. Here, we have to write a pipeline to read the data. Okay? And then we have to basically specify what the columns are. So these are the columns that we are reading from the data. We have to basically specify what types the columns are. Okay? That the fair amount is a floating point number and the pickup date time is a string, et cetera. And then we have to specify how much we're going to, like what, the, what our batch size is. In this case, I'm going to say it's 32. But the nice thing is that unlike TensorFlow 1, much of the reading is much simpler. There's no queue runners and none of that stuff there. You basically say, I want to read a data set. So we're re reading a CSV data set from some location in, in GCS, passing in the batch size, passing in the name of the columns, passing in the data types, which is what the defaults are for. That gives us a data set. And then once we have our data set, we can now basically say, remove all the columns that we don't want and then take our label column and then basically return the features and the label. So that's a raw data and the label. 
So basically, now that I have this function that pulls the appropriate piece out, I can go ahead and go to the data set and call map, passing in the function that takes one row of data from my CSV and pulls out the things that I want to train on. Then, of course, because I want to do distributed training, I basically shuffle the data, right? So I'm reading much more than a batch, shuffling it, sending it to multiple workers if necessary, and repeating it indefinitely, right? The idea being that we want to keep training over and over again. So we've now read in the data. That's good. The next bit is to write our model, right? The simplest way to write a model in Keras is to say, take my input, flatten it, pass it through a dense layer of, say, 512 nodes. And because it's now Keras, we can add re dropout very easily. Let's go ahead and add a dropout layer and then pass it off to an output. In this case, I want to basically do a softmax with 10 outputs. So this is a classification model. Right? The output node basically controls what kind of model you're building. That, what I showed you here, is a sequential model. You're basically putting the layers one after the other, which is great if all you want to do is to basically do a not straightforward, but if you have things like branching, the same input goes to two different layers, you cannot do it this way. So then you have a more powerful way to express it, and that's the functional API. So in this case, right, I'm taking my input, I'm passing it to a dense layer, I'm giving that variable x, and I can take that variable and pass it to multiple layers if I want. But in this case, I'm taking that x, passing it to a dropout layer, calling this also x, passing it to another dense layer, calling that also x. So in this case, it's still a linear model, but it gives me that flexibility to pass it to multiple outputs, mul no, take multiple inputs, concatenate them, gives me all of that ability. But once I've done that, I take my inputs, I take my final output, and create a Keras model. So whether I create a model using the sequential layers or using the functional API, I'll end up with a Keras model. And once I have my Keras model, I can compile it, specifying the optimizer, specifying the loss function, specifying the metric, and then call fit, which will train it, and call evaluate, which will evaluate it. Right? So it's Python, but we're doing exactly the same things that we did when we did it in SQL, with the only, you know, in some ways, extra work in that we have to read in the data because unlike with SQL in BigQuery, the data is somewhere else, and this is, a, this is, a, this is just a, a way to basically train a model. So we've, we can now train and evaluate these models, but again, the output layer is very, very, very important because that's how you control what type of model you're building. So if you want to train a regression model, make sure that your output layer has one, one output because it's one number that you want to, want to predict and the activation is linear. If you want to do binary classification, the activation function needs to be sigmoid. If it's multi-classification, categorical variables, number of classes with a softmax, right? That is if only you want to have one correct answer. But if you will have multiple correct answers, it could be the same thing could be part of multiple classes then the activation would be a sigmoid, right? And the loss functions, again, change depending on what it is that you want to train on. Fair enough? Yeah. So we've created our Keras model. We can also then go ahead and create our custom evaluation metrics. So we want to do RMSE, right? This is how you do it. You say these are the true label, this is the prediction, compute the square root of the square of these things reduce it over the entire data set, come up to one number, compute the square root, and then pass in your extra metric in addition to the ones that Keras already knows. And if you want to do distributed training, then what you do is that you create a strategy. Right? So this is called mirror strategy, TFT distributed mirror strategy, which is what you do if you have multiple GPUs and one machine. Right? You have multi-worker mirror strategy, which is if you have multiple GPUs and multiple workers. Right? So you create the appropriate strategy, and you pass it in with a distribute flag. Another thing that you might often see is people create the strategy in a scope and put the model creation inside the scope. That also works. 
right? But either way, all that you need to do now if you want to do distribution is to create an appropriate strategy. So things have gotten a lot easier in 2.0 compared to the way we had to do it earlier. Fair enough? Cool. And if you want to do failure handling, like whenever you do distribute a training, you always run the risk that this machine will die. Right? And when, when you restart the job, you don't want to start from the very beginning. You want to start from some intermediate point. And so you want to save these intermediate points. Those are called checkpoints. And so in Keras, what you would do is that you would set up a model checkpoint saying like, you know, where you want them to be saved. And when you call model.fit, you would basically add in the checkpoint callback. And the idea then is that maybe every 100 iterations, it checkpoints. And then if the machines die on the 132nd iteration, when the machines come back up, or you restart the job, you don't have to start at iteration 0. You can start at iteration 100 because you have a checkpoint for that. Right? And that part is handled automatically. Look, look at the checkpoints. Start from there. Okay. So we've done no, TF data. We've created our Keras model. And then we've done a distribution strategy to basically train uh, wherever we want. So you have a distribution strategy for CPUs mirrored for GPUs, TPU strategy if you want to train on GPUs, TPUs. So it's just a question of changing the class and the rest of your code remains essentially the same. Okay? The next thing that you need to do is to basically export out a saved model. Why do you need a saved model? Inference. For inference, because you want to predict. right? So you want to basically export out a saved model so that you can basically deploy it to any of those places for serving, whether it's on a web server with TF serving, whether it's mobile devices with TF Lite, they all go through that saved model. So how does that work? Well, the way that works is very, very, very straightforward. Just call model.save. Okay. Uh, by the cool thing about Keras, and the reason that this all works so well, is that when you created the model, you always create it with an input layer. And that's, by default, the exact same inputs that you need for serving. Right? So as long as so Keras knows right, what the inputs are, and because Keras knows what the inputs are, exporting, which used to be super complex, and uh, no, I think one of my highest rated answers in Stack Overflow is, what exactly is a serving input function? Well, there's, you don't need to write a serving input function anymore. Right? By default, it can basically take the input of the Keras model and use it to basically write it out. So once it's written out, then right, whoever the serving infrastructure is will load the model and call predict on it. Okay? So you, you tend not to have to write this code. But this is the code that lives on the prediction infrastructure. So if you're using TF serving, that's basically all that it's doing. So save and load model just works the way you would expect it to work. So yes? Like, I do not have to make any changes if I have to deploy it on a uh, mobile device? You didn't, OK. The question is, do I not have to make any changes to deploy it on a mobile device? You do not have to make changes to your code, but you will take your saved model and you will pass it through something that will do the stripping and freezing and all that before you do it. And that's the kind of thing that gets built into the IDEs that you use for building mobile device, mobile things. So yeah, so you don't write any code, but you will, you will run a tool on the saved model to make it smaller. Right. Yes? The model that we create, like this is the CPU or the GPU or the CPU. Right. Uh, that's a great question. If I, if I do a distributed training and I train on a CPU or a GPU or a TPU, is it going to be the same model? Let's take the CPU and GPU first. The CPU and GPU are exactly the same. For the TPU model, it depends because what the TPU does is one of the ways it gets its efficiency is that it basically uses a different floating point representation. But it exports both models. It exports a model that can be served only on a TPU and a model that can be served on a CPU or GPU. And then you basically choose. Right? So the TPU strategy gives you both. The CPU and GPU only give you their, like, you know, their normal IEEE floating point. Okay. Questions? Cool. Okay. 
So now it all comes down to your input function, right? The keras depends on that input layer, and it's that input layer that we're going to basically use for the rest of the model. That's why exporting worked beautifully. So great, but how do I write an input layer for a keras, for a keras model, which is a neural network, when I have a categorical data, right? It doesn't really, it, that doesn't translate really easily. So what you have to do is that every input that you have, you have to basically specify how it's going to get mapped into a number, because that's essentially what all neural networks essentially can work off of. So you need to create a separate input layer for every single column in your data. Okay? So exporting is easy. You get your serving function really easily. But the only reason it works is because you had a Keras input layer, which means now that when you create your Keras model, you need to have a separate input layer for every column of your data. Does that make sense to everyone? Right? So in this case, I have a pickup longitude and a pickup latitude. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a numeric column for each of those input columns. Okay? But this is still not a Keras input layer. It is just a numeric column. So I need to use this right, to basically create what's called a dense features, <coughs> passing in my feature columns, and passing in an input. And this is the Keras input layer where that has the appropriate column name. So you have to do two things now. You have to basically create an input layer for every input into your model. And you have to create a feature column that says how you're going to take that input and make it numeric. And if it's a number, it's just passed through, which is what I've shown you now. But later, I'll show you more complex things that you can do. That's where the feature engineering comes in. Okay? So bottom line then, all of these are input layers. They all go into the dense features. Right? So this is now the input into our model. And then once I have my dense features, the rest of it is exactly the same. right? I basically create a bunch of Keras layers and create my output. Does this make sense to everyone? Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look. So again, all of the code that I'm showing you is on GitHub. It's, I'll, I'll put up a link to the repo later. So the one I'm currently looking at is 04 Keras, and there is a Keras DNN.ipython notebook. Right? So that's the, basically the one that I'm going to be loading up. Um, 04 Keras and uh, Keras Deep Neural Network. So what I'm doing here is essentially what I showed you on the slides. Uh, I'm going to be importing TensorFlow. And notice that all this will work only if we are using uh, a nightly build of TensorFlow. OK, so this is a nightly build of TensorFlow, right, as of September 8th. Uh, then like, um, you know, the files that are there, I'm creating the CSV columns, and I'm mapping them. And then I'm basically creating, this is where the uh, DNN model, so this is where I'm putting it all together. Here are my input columns. For every one of those columns, I'm creating a Keras input layer. And then for each of those columns, I'm also, in this case, every one of them is a numeric column. So I'm creating a feature column. And then I'm using both of these, the inputs and the feature columns, to create the inputs to the deep neural network. Once I have my DNN inputs, the rest of it is like any other network model that you build in Keras. And then I'm basically compiling the model. And having done that, I can plot the model. Right? So this is a new function. Right? Once you have a model, you don't have to just run a summary. You can plot it. So this is basically a nice plot of what it is that you built. And then we can call model.fit to train the model on the training data set, right? evaluate it every once in a while on the evaluation data set. And it's now going ahead in its training. Okay. So that's pretty much what the process looks like. 
Yes. In this case, if I'm in this case, I did not specify a distributed strategy, so it's just one machine. But if I had specified multi-worker, it would be multiple workers. How does it handle the storage? Because we do already prepare. Right. So different. Yes. Yeah. So the question is, how does it handle storage? There is a whole page on different Kara strategies for distribution. So there is a centralized storage way of doing it. There's a way of using parameter servers. Right. So there's you have multiple options. Right, and uh, there is a different strategy for each. So you get to choose which one you're using. So once you do that, you can, of course, plot the you know, loss and RMSE. And then you can basically uh, go ahead and predict the, mo predict the model. And you can export the model by basically calling model.safe. Okay? So let's go back. Okay. So that was Keras. But at this point, all that we've done is that we've just done the raw thing that you know, it took us a long time to get here, but we only did the thing that we did in SQL and BigQuery, where we took the input data and we trained a DNN on it. We didn't do anything fancy. I promised you feature engineering. So let's talk about how you do feature engineering. So in BigQuery, right, or any kind of feature engineering, the easy thing is if you have numbers, you just take the numbers. But what if you have other types of data? There's a whole bunch of different types of data that you could have. You could have categorical data. You could have data that's red, green, and blue. What do you do with it? You typically one-hot encode it, right? In this case, this is something that's green, right? Zero, one, zero is green. Zero, zero, one is blue, and so on, okay? The other thing that you might do is you might have a number, but this number is a number like 42, and you say, well, I don't want to basically train on all the different numbers. Instead, I want to basically make them medium large or extra large. So that's bucketizing. And then what you do is you take your number, you bucketize it, and you one hot encode those buckets. So this is like red, green, blue, right? But you don't, you don't take the number 42 and use it as is. You bucketize it and use the buckets as an input into your model. The third option is that you have both of those. You have red, green, blue, and you have a t-shirt size. And rather than treat it as two separate inputs, you feature cross them. So now you have a separate input for red and large and a separate input for blue and large. Okay? So that's called feature crossing, and you can do this one-hot encoding, right? Or you can also do what's called embedding. The problem with one-hot encoding these is that you get way too many of them. Imagine that this categorical variable has 15,000 product categories, right? And you have you know, another 15,000 of something else. You basically have an explosion. So what you sometimes do is that you take those things and you basically represent them as a vector, and that's called embedding, as of the lower dimensional value, right? Sometimes you don't know all the possible categories. You need to know all the possible categories if you want to do one hot encoding. So if sometimes you get a customer ID and you don't know every single customer ID that you could possibly have. In that case, you do what's called hashing, right? So you have a variety of ways to basically take your input value and make a feature column out of it. And naturally, the reason I'm talking about all of these is that there is a corresponding feature column for each of these in Keras. Right? So you have a Keras hashed categorical column, for example. But this is great, and we can do the transformation, but a big problem happens at inference time. Because suppose we took our number 42, and we bucketized it and made it medium large, extra large, what does our model expect? Does it expect 42 or medium large, extra large? Medium large, extra large. Will the person who's sending the data in at inference time, will they know how to bucketize your data? No. That's a huge problem. And this is one of the reasons why people say putting ML into production is very hard because of all these things that you have to do. Yes, sir. Okay, that's a great question. Does our one hot encoding process leave out one of those things? So this is one of the stuff that statisticians, right, will basically talk about the fact that if you do a one hot encoding and not like you know uh, basically leave out that one, you basically get things that are linearly dependent, right? With machine learning, you tend not to worry about it. Okay. 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 So the idea then is suppose we did this. This, is, this was the example that I showed you with the bikes data, 
We took the start date and we extracted the day of the week and we extracted the hour of the day. Now, when somebody does a prediction, what do they have to do? They have to pass in the station name. They have to pass in three as the day of the week and 18 as the hour of the day because that's what the model was trained on. But is, should you pass in three for Tuesday or is it three for Wednesday? I mean, you, you, get, you get the problem, right? And this is a real problem when you put ML into production. So the ideal thing is that the model knows how to do the transformations that it needs. So with BigQuery, the basic idea is when you do your select, you select the raw data. I select the duration, the start station name, and the start date. And I put in a transform clause where I say in my transform clause, select everything except the start date. So I get duration and start station name. And instead of the start date, I'm going to extract the day of the week from the start date, hour of, hour of the day from the start date. And these are the inputs to train my model. Now at prediction time, I can just pass in King's Cross as the start station name and current timestamp as the start date. And the model knows how to pull out the day of the week and the hour of the day. Notice how much easier productionization now gets. Right? So you want to think in terms of these transformations whenever you do that. So let's go ahead and take a look at how to do this in BigQuery. So in this case, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to pick this other model, okay? which is on feature engineering, feature engineering in BigQuery ML. And now, right, in addition to these things, I can basically start doing stuff like, go ahead and make a geographic point of the pickup longitude, pickup latitude, take these two geographic points, compute the distance. Right, that's an input, day of the week, hour of the day, these are my data points. But then when I train my model, I just need pick up lawn, pick up lat, all of that stuff. Yes? What best practices have you done for missing data? What best practices have we done for missing data? In essence, whenever something is a null, it basically goes and imputes things. What right. if null is not consistently going? Right. So then you go back to that options thing. You can specify how else you want to do it. Right? <laughs> Ah, that's a great point. Is BigQuery ML going to identify and tell you certain features? No, it doesn't. It's not a data exploration tool, right? So this is why I said like, the data scientists need, the need to explore the data, clean it up. That doesn't go away. You notice that I showed you the fact that I had to clean up the data to get better models. That does not go away. What we're making simpler is this process of training the data model. Yes? I kind of want to make sure I understand something. Are you yeah. saying Exactly. So, yes. Yeah, so, the, right. The, the, to summarize, everything inside the transform class gets stored in the exported model so that at inference time, all these transformations are automatically applied so that at inference time, you only need to pass in the raw data, which is exactly what we wanted. Yes. Uh, right, so ST distance is actually a real distance on the surface of the Earth, a great circle distance. But I mean, we could have just computed square root and or we could have done absolute value or whatever. That's what you would have done if I had to do it myself. But the fact that there's a GIS function in BigQuery makes it nicer. I can basically rely on the great circle mm -hmm. distance. Yes. Uh, what do you mean by when you have a lot of features, it's going to blow out? Right. Your SQL queries get very complex, right? So you can write SQL functions to help you there, right? So those are the, yes, absolutely. So you can write UDFs, 
user-defined functions or SQL functions to help you manage the SQL. But at the end of the day, you'll have it, your SQL query now becomes long, the bigger it is, right? I, I create my models so that they fit on a slide, but that may not always be practical. Yes. Right. Right. So if we could have, for example, gone in here and at ml.embed, take this thing and bring it down to two dimensions. Uh, so what is the best? Two or like two? Or ah, good question, right? What is, the, what is the number I need to choose here? Well, that's a hyperparameter, and we have to tune it. And you can tune it back to AI platform. AI platform gives you a way to do a Bayesian hyperparameter tuning of any machine learning model, including BigQuery ML models. So you can totally use AI platform's hyperparameter tuning to figure out what the right numbers are here. Yes. Right, yeah, absolutely. I mean, is there a way to take my transform function and separate it so that I can do it ahead of time? Not in BigQuery ML, because again, the idea is that, hey, it's distributed, what do you care, right? It'll just run it on multiple machines. But if you're doing TensorFlow and Keras, there's a library called TF Transform that ex does exactly that. And the idea is that you write a TF Transform code, you run it in Apache Beam, pre-create it, but it writes those artifacts in as a TensorFlow model thing and therefore it gets available during inference. So it's called TF transform and that's exactly the idea to do that. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. This is just yeah. So the question is is this the ideal model? No, of course not, right? This is the first cell in my notebook. There's more cells and I keep adding more features, right? <laughs> so yes, there are other things that we can do, but this is a this is a, this is a good start. And this illustrates the point here of how it is that you basically add extra features. Okay. All right. So we've looked at feature engineering in BigQuery and in the next 10 minutes Let's quickly look through feature engineering in Keras. How does that work? Okay. So here, this is basically what we want to do. We want to do the exact same thing. We want to take our pickup date time. We want to get the hour of the day, the day of the week. We want to take the latitudes, longitudes, scale them. We want to compute, in this case, I don't have GIS functions available to me, so I'll just compute a Euclidean distance, right? And then take all of these, pass them into a dense features. And then, I'm done. Right? Once I have my dense features, all my feature engineering is done, and then I basically create my DNN model in Keras. Fair enough? So let's look at how we would do that. Okay. So if you want to basically replace a feature column by a scaled value, you basically think in terms of this transform idea again. right? It's a good idea to think of, I have my original raw data, I'm going to transform it. So I have a new dictionary of transformed things, and the transformed longitude column is a lambda layer in Keras where what I'm doing is I'm taking the original value, I'm adding 78 and dividing by eight, because I know those are the numbers that happen in New York. It's between minus 70 and minus 78, so this basically brings it down to zero to one. Okay? So that's my scaled value, so that's a pretty easy thing. So the bottom line is, if you wanna apply your own custom function in Keras, use a lambda layer as your transform layer. So if you want to create a brand new feature, so here's my Euclidean distance. I want to compute it, la longitude diff, latitude diff, return, return that whole thing. Then I basically create a transformed feature that's called Euclidean, which is a lambda layer, which basically takes all of these inputs. So I take the original inputs, I apply this function, and I create a new transform layer. Notice a big difference, though. Euclidean is not an input layer. And because it's not an input layer, the model is not going to ask our serving function to give it to us. It will compute it from the inputs that we get. Right? Notice a nice thing here where Keras is distinguished between input layers and computed values. 
and Euclidean is a computed value. It doesn't need to come in during, uh, during serving. It'll get automatically computed. Okay, so again, bottom line is use a lambda layer. One, and then you can also, and this is new in TensorFlow 2.0, it doesn't all need to be TensorFlow functions. My day of the week, right, day of the week is basically going to be this function, which is using the Python datetime library. And that's fine. It's going to be slower than if you use all TensorFlow functions, because it'll have to kick it out of the GPU, but it'll work. Okay. So it'll do the automatic differentiation and do all that. So you can call random functions, not random functions. You can call arbitrary functions here, right? Uh, that you can basically uh, get it included. It doesn't have to be something that can be done in a TensorFlow graph. Okay. And again, all the demo code that I showed you is on GitHub. That's the repo, right? If you want to take a, you know, a photograph of it. Cool. And to learn more, a couple of books, shameless plugs, right? Uh, 